and we'll walk through it. You can use um, the financial calculator to do a fair few things. It'd be maybe handy to have that ready, but you may also choose to use Excel to solve a lot of the um, problems we'll be doing today. What correlation is all about is trying to see, is there a, an association between two variables, such as perhaps the amount of money we might spend on advertising and the level of sales? We'd be definitely interested in measuring that. Uh, otherwise, we wouldn't bother advertising if there was no possible uh, link in, of an increase in sales. Uh, based on the amount of money we spend on advertising. But yeah, a few other things, the number of breakdowns in a certain type of machine, the level of education and their income. So all sorts of things we might be interested in studying in correlation. And, and it's part of our statistical analysis and will form part of, um, uh, obviously, part of your assessment in the final exam, but also uh, in the uh, upcoming assessment three, uh, correlation will also feature. These are some of the buttons. If we did decide to use the financial calculator to solve it, uh, again, second function alpha zero zero to clear the memory, if there was memory in there, and uh, mode uh, one for stats, and we're using two sets of data now. Well, we've got the X series and the Y series of data, the dependent and the independent data. So we would actually have to go mode one one for a line, we're going to be drawing a line. And some of the other buttons that uh, we'll be pushing today, um, if we want to find later on, we'll be looking at the uh, linear equation. If we wanted to find the y-intercept, this little division key's got a little green A above it. So it would be recall division key for the y-intercept and recall B for the slope. So recall delete for the, for the slope of the line. Uh, easy way possibly to remember that is uh, B sloping down the hill, perhaps. Recall B, and we've got A intercept, maybe. Maybe that helps you. Just a bit of bad grammar or something like that might be a memory jogger for you. Uh, this little correlation, ah, correlation coefficient. Uh, so again, recall, because it's green, recall an open bracket. We'll get the correlation coefficient happening. And also this little prediction of y. We could key in any x value, and it's uh, the financial calculator has the memory, st uh, the uh, formula stored in the slope and the y-intercept. So we could go if the value of x was 12, uh, second function open bracket. Please predict uh, what the value of y would be. So uh, 12 second function open bracket equals, and we could see what y is. Uh, conversely, we could uh, key in a y value. If y was 56, 56 second function and um, the x button we w equals, we could predict for any given y value what the prediction of x must have been. So they're the main buttons. But to get the data in, uh, when you start to enter your X series of data, you'll enter your, say, imagine X was 12, 1, 2, and press the XY button. And then if Y was 89, press 89 and press the enter. And the screen will say data set 1, and you're ready to move on to the second, the next set of data. You can then scroll down through your data to check if you'd entered it correctly. It'll always say data set one, you know, the numbers X1 was this, Y1 was this, and you scroll down, the frequency was one. You only entered it once. So that's a quick whiz -bend look at uh, some of the buttons using the financial calculator. Um, what we need to do is make sure we have the right variable, make sure when we're trying to work out which is the dependent variable and which is the independent variable. We want the independent variable on the horizontal, the x-axis, and we want the dependent variable on the y-axis. So which is which? Uh, we'll, we'll get a bit of practice at identifying them, but essentially the independent variable is the variable that you could manipulate or change. And what you're trying to measure is as I change what's happening in x, What's the effect in Y? This is the, what we're trying to measure here. So um, possibly, you know, imagine we've got the size of the engine and we're trying to measure fuel economy. So 
size of the engine would be on X and fuel economy on Y. The example I used before, the amount of money spent on advertising would be down here on the X and we're trying to measure the um, correlating or the, the, um, the uh, effect on sales up on the y's, uh, Y axis. So let's have a just quick look at uh, straight line theory and Let's have a look at the cost curve. It's not really a cost curve, it's a straight line. But something you might be familiar with, particularly if you've done management accounting, is uh, the total cost, obviously, in, in any accounting, equals our fixed cost plus the variable cost. If the fixed cost was $100 and the variable cost was $10 per unit, uh, and we were allowing X to be the number of units, well, essentially, um, if x was zero. If we've got zero units, then the, um, the y-axis, the y-intercept, is the fixed cost at $100. Um, so let's just see how that might play out. Uh, and in fact, we will in a moment or two. We'll have a look at that, um, that curve. Um, there is a couple of YouTube clips we'll refer to in class that would, would help with you identifying the dependent and the independent variable. But let's try and work it out even just on the, the, the knowledge that we have right now, that, that is that the independent variable is the, the variable that we are trying to manipulate or change. And, and then what we're trying to measure is up on the Y axis, the dependent variable. So which is dependent and which is independent? If we were in class, I'd actually ask you each of these, but let's think them through together. Uh, from these two, just give you, for the first one, I'll just give you three seconds to have a bit of a guess as to which might be the X and which might be the Y. All right. Maybe you guessed that the dose of medicine is that the effect on patients is what you're trying to measure. Sometimes it's easy to pick the Y first and then you know, you know what the X is. And of course, we are as we change different levels of uh, dosage, we want to see what the effect might be, measure the effect on patients. Interest rates versus the number of new housing loans. Uh, we'd probably be interested in looking at a range of interest rates on our X uh, uh, value and see what the corresponding effect might be. The assumption might be that as interest rates drop, uh, housing loans uh, applications will increase. The age of vehicle versus the cost of repairs. This is an easier one because time always goes on the x-axis. You can't, you can't uh, change time. Uh, so the age of the vehicle is uh, you, you will be down on the X and then what you're trying to measure is as the age changes, what is the cost of repairs? Size of the engine versus fuel economy. This is the X, this is the Y, what you're trying to measure. Income versus age. Again, we can't change the age. So what we'll do is age will be down on the X axis and income is what we're trying to uh, measure on the y-axis, the assumption being that um, the older we are, the more experienced we are. Perhaps we've had a chance to get, gain a promotion and we'll have a higher income. Um, advertising versus sales, we've talked about that. Hours of study versus exam results. Well, we might try and uh, have a, a people in our study and we've got a range of different hours of study and we're trying to measure how did it impact their exam results. And of course, time versus the All Ordinaries Index. Time, we always said, would be on the x-axis and the All Ordinaries Index on the y, the vertical axis. So um, perhaps we're doing a study and we're trying to look at the relative, you know, is there some sort of correlation between a person's height and their weight? So we've got a range, we've got a sample of 12 adults here. And so uh, what we might be trying to suggest here is that it seems to make sense that uh, the taller you were, uh, taller you are, the heavier you are, and it seems to be sloping up, that as X is increasing, as height is increasing, so is weight. We call this a positive correlation. Both of them are increasing, and when it slopes up to the right, it's a positive correlation. Uh, more of that in a moment. 
So uh, this is uh, the Pearson Product Moment Correlation Coefficient is the full title. A bit of a mouthful there. Uh, whenever we're dealing with a sample, uh, it's known by this um, Roman numeral R. And uh, that's what we saw on the calculator a moment ago. Um, if it's the population we're doing the correlation coefficient on, it's the Greek letter rho. Apparently we're supposed to roll the tongue like the Scottish R. Rho. Anyway, there it is uh, for the population. We will spend most of our time calculating R, and most of the formulas you'll see will have R. Sounds like we're pirates, doesn't it? Har me hearties. Okay, enough of that. Well, R uh, has to lie between minus 1 and positive 1. Uh, let's just try and see uh, if it's really close. In fact, if all the dots are on the line, it's going to be it's going to be a slope of we're going to have a correlation of positive one. And if all the dots are on the line sloping down, uh, we're going to have a perfect positive negative correlation. Sorry, a perfect negative correlation because there's no deviation from the line. But pretty much anything around um, you know 90 percent, 0 0.9, 0 0.8, quite strong positive. Minus 0.8, minus 0.9, quite strong negative. Let's have a look at what it might look like. And, and we'll have a look at the formula first. Uh, what, it seemed, what it's trying to do is essentially um, give us an indication of the slope of the line, if you like, by looking at um, x and its relation to the mean and y and its relation to the mean. And so there's a, and then the, the two, um, deviations from the mean multiplied together and adding it up. So the mathematicians have spent quite a bit of time coming up with a formula like this, and believe it or not, it works. So let's see if we can, well, most of the time it works. So um, again, we said before, it is the recall open bracket that's going to give us the correlation coefficient. So uh, here we are with a study of 30 students uh, with the different hours of study and their exam results. And uh, the results we're seeing is, yes, there does seem to be some sort of correlation between the two, is what we'd expect. It's not perfect. The dots aren't on, on a perfect straight line. There is some deviation, but it looks like there's a fairly strong positive correlation here. Uh, here we've got a fairly strong negative correlation. We're graphing uh, with the same sample of 30 students, perhaps, and we're measuring their driving scores as they consume more alcohol, and we would assume that the uh, more alcohol it was consumed, the lower your driving test result. And so we can see a sloping down to the right as X is increasing, Y is decreasing. So a strong negative correlation. And finally, we thought, we is there a correlation between the number of shoes that somebody might have in their wardrobe and the number of car accidents they would have? So if we're to try and graph that, but this is the sort of result we might expect. Dots are all over the place. There didn't seem to be any sort of correlation between these two uh, variables at all. So we've said straight away, all the dots on a straight line uh, are a positive one. A strong or high positive correlation. Dots are gathered together and low, around about 0.3. Zero, nothing, no correlation. Same here with the negative or the dots all on the line, uh, we get a correlation of minus one. If it's a strong or high negative correlation, 0 0.8, 0 0.9, and zero correlation, zero. Dots everywhere. Let's have a look a little bit more at our straight line theory for a moment. Um, here, this particular set of set of data here, one, two, and three. Uh, interestingly enough, the slope of this particular curve, the change in y is two over the change in x is one. So the slope of this line would be uh, two. Change in change in x, sorry, change in y was two over the change in x one. Slope of the line is two. Uh, so positive 2, as x is increasing, y is increasing. Here, uh, and we've got a negative slope. If the slope is negative, so is the correlation. As x is increasing, 
y is decreasing. Change in y, 4 minus 6 is minus 2 over the change in x is positive 1. So we've got a negative slope of minus 2 and a perfect negative correlation. We'll have a look at how that looks on the, um, if we were to graph it in Excel, here's the dots plotted and there they are when x was 1, y was 2, when x was 2, y was 4. All the dots are on the line. Perfect positive correlation and perfect negative when x was 1, y was 6, when x was 2, y was 4, dots sloping down. And again, if we were to keep tracking with this line, we could see when does it cross the x-axis. And it seems that when x was 0, y was also 0. So there is the y-intercept, the y-intercept being 0. Essentially, this straight line formula was y equals 2x. There is plus the y-intercept, which is 0. So basically, we're left with y equals 2x is the that line. What about this one? Where, where would this one um, cross the x-axis? Looks, looks like it's going to be y equals, um, when x is 0, y equals 8. So this formula here would be uh, y equals 8 minus 2x. Uh, we might have a look at, I think we're looking at this data set at the moment, height versus weight. Um, again, I think we've talked about if you were to key it in, just work out which is your x. You've decided that height is down on your x. You're trying to see uh, what the change in weight might be as height increases. So we'd go 167xy, 71.8 enter, 168xy, 72 enter those two buttons there on our financial calculator to get all of the data in. And then it would be recall, um, recall ah, to find the correlation coefficient. This is what's going on in the engine room of Excel and the engine room of your financial calculator. This is the raw data. There's all of my X. There's all of my Y data. Essentially, I then need to find the mean of X by adding up all the X scores and, and dividing by the number of pieces of data I've got. So there were 12 pieces in my sample. I've got an average height of 164.3. Do the same for the weights, add up the weights, divide by 12, average weight 66.2, 66.6. And then find the deviation from each score's deviation from the mean. So 167 minus 164.3, 2.7 above the mean. Keep going down our data set and uh, get all of the variations from the mean of X. Do the same for Y. 71.8 minus 66.6 is 7.29 above the mean. 72 minus 66.6 is 13.69. I hope I've got that right. So, oh, sorry, that's x squared. I do apologize. Where I'm, I'm in the wrong column. Um, here we go. Deviation for the mean: seventy-one point eight minus sixty-six point six, five point two away from the mean. Seventy-two minus sixty-six point six, five point four away from the mean. Mean. Now square all of the deviation for the mean. Square them and then multiply both deviations of x, uh, x from its deviation of the mean, y from its deviation from the mean, multiply the two figures together, 2.7 times 5.2 equals that, and then add it up. And essentially, the uh, once we've got the totals of each of these columns, what's going on in your calculator, the little r that's being calculated is ga gathering uh, this data. If we had the formula in front of us, it'll be on your formula sheet. But it's essentially um, this, and in your textbook, this uh, amount here, divided by the square root of the sum of x minus its deviation squared times the sum of y and its deviation squared added up. Deviation squared added up. Uh, you could calculate that manually if you like. It looks like the answer is 0.82, which mm -hmm. is a pretty strong positive correlation. 
the calculator also has these SX, SXY buttons and SSX, but we don't need it. We can go recall line or we'll, have, we'll, get, we'll get our answer for B. Um, it's important to note that just because we find a correlation doesn't necessarily imply that one event causes the other. There is some uh, degree of association, but it may not be directly proportional. And just because it happens, it could be a fluke. It could be just your sample is a bad sample and it just happened to look like. So just, it is a statistical measure. It implies that the, there's a correlation, but doesn't necessarily, you know, it doesn't necessarily mean that's the case. So let's have a look at a couple of examples uh, of where this might be the case. So you've done a study and you found a group of male school children between 6 and 13 and you've gathered their heights and their reading comprehension. You're trying to see and you found that there was a positive correlation between the two variables. Well, it's just most likely just a fluke because common sense says that there, doesn't, there shouldn't be any real just because you're taller doesn't mean you're going to be a better reader. So we sort of get that. I'm just going to check that this is still recording properly. Just bear with me for one moment. I've got to check another laptop. Um, and, uh, and you know, the, the, the price of wine casks are going up and then sales are also going up. Is that, and we found there was a high positive correlation. Well, it's a bad conclusion if we suggest that, oh, when prices go up, that sales go up. It's most, it's, that's the, the, we'd expect the opposite, that demand would increase when prices drop rather than when prices go up. So it's, it's a, um, one more. Um, we've found 50 adults at random and we've measured the lengths of their left arm and their right legs. And we've found, um, uh, wait a minute, um, well, I think we would. If we've, if we've measured their left arms and the right legs, we'd, we'd expect there to be some sort of correlation. There'd be some sort of ratio that would um, make that right. Oops, no, it says it makes no sense. The left arm is a cause of the length of the right leg. That's interesting. That's really interesting because I thought there would be. The taller you are, then you're going to have a longer left arm. I thought the ratio would work. Um, hmm, interesting. Um, I'll let you think about it. Um, you can agree with me or agree with the author. Um, um, maybe we could do a study, work it out. Um, okay, so here's uh, this predicted line, if you like, this alpha and beta. Uh, we can find the least squares regression line for the y-intercept of our regression line and the slope of our regression line. And we can pretty much draw a line that tries to minimize the distance between all the dots. Let's have a look at it. We can also test for the significance of the correlation using this little t-test. And the t-test says, um, let's get the correlation and multiply by the square root of the sample size minus 2 over 1 minus r squared. So, um, so let's have a look at how we might work that. We've decided in this instance that we're prepared to um, live with a risk that we, we might be, you know, an alpha rate, an error rate of 5%. In other words, we want to be 95% uh, confident. So the T-table uses this thing called uh, the degrees of freedom, and it's N minus 2. So let's go and have a look there. We'll have a look at some tables so that you've got Z tables in your textbook. You've also got some T tables in your textbook. So we gathered some data that the, the 12 female heights and their weights, there were 12 of them, and we found that R was 0.82. And we're trying to test whether that is significant based on this sample of 12. So what we'll do, the T test says, just applying the data, plugging it in, grab the correlation, which we found was 0.82, multiply by the square root of sample size was 12, minus 2 is 10, over 1 minus 0.82 squared. So we do that, we crunch those numbers. Remember to do, I would do this part of the calculation first, store in memory. Then I'd go uh, 10 
minus recall memory equals, in fact, I'll, I'll push the buttons in my mind, what I would do, I would go 0.82 times 0.82 equals store A. Then I'd go 1 minus recall A equals store A. And so therefore, I have this now in memory location A. Then I'd go 10 minus recall A equals store A. Pretty much I know all of this is now in memory location A. Then I go find the function for the square root. Second function, I think it's two, could be three. Second, but look at your calculator, work out which it is. Uh, so second function, whatever it is, uh, recall A to find the square root. And finally, whatever you get there is you make sure you hit equals and then go times 0.82. So test that. Make sure you can get, when you crunch those numbers, that you can get 4.53. Well, then we've got to check uh, what does the critical value suggest um, is sh the, the, the answer should be. And we're going to test then, see if the previous slide tells us, whether it's within, whether the T value is less than the critical value or more. Uh, we're going to try and see if it's significant, if it's in that range. So uh, let's go and look it up and see what we find. So we come down, the sample size was 12, uh, and n minus 2 degrees of freedom, so 12 minus 2 is 10. So that degrees of freedom crops up a lot in statistics. And the level, the error rate, the alpha rate that we're prepared to accept is 5%. We want to be 95% confident. And we get this answer of 2.2. And so um, what we're going to suggest then is because our formula here when we did the t-test was greater than 2.28, 2.228, we're going to suggest that R is significant. I mean, looking at R itself, it is strong. It is strong, but we're, you know, we're just adjusting it for the size of the sample. Possibly our sample size is too small. To be, to be confident, but we could be 95% confident um, that even though our sample size is small uh, and that there's a potential, if we picked another sample, we might get a different value for R, which may be less than that 0.82. We could be, this sort of is suggesting, this T formula is suggesting that even with a different sample, uh, that is suggesting that it's going to be significant. All right, so that is um, correlation. Let's have a look at regression analysis. What this does is enable us, once we've got our um, formula, uh, we can, least squares regression formula, we can then use that to predict y for any value of x. So um, we, can, we can, again, we can do this in Excel. Um, we'll have a look at Excel in a minute to see how it works, but uh, let's have a look at it. So, if you didn't have that line there, if you just had the, dot, the dots, you'd graphed all the X dots and graphed all the corresponding Y dots, you could just sort of use, you know, the line of best fit and guess which line it is minimizes the dots. But the regression line attempts to minimize the distance of all of the dots by doing the little average of the X's and their relationship to the Y and Y and its relationship to all the other dots. So it finds the line that supposedly is a, a enables us to predict because we don't have all of the X data. Now technically we should only use the, the regression line to predict within the range of data that we have. So we're using it for interpolation, not extrapolation. Extrapolation means I'm going to try and go beyond the data set and, and go out here somewhere. But how can I be sure that the data may not may not bend up? Um, and a classic example might be um, if we had a spring, a metal spring, imagine that, and we're trying to measure how far it stretches as we put different weights on it. I mean, eventually, if you put enough weight on it, the, the spring could break. And so we'll be outside. It would be wrong to use this to predict outside the data range. So this is what our regression equation will look like, our predicted value of y, uh, once we know the slope of the regression line and the, the intercept. 
So uh, here we've got some uh, time and some stock. So we're going to try and graph it and see, would this be a good, is, is, is this, could we somehow come up with a regression line that would help us predict within the range? And the answer is no. Well, because there's, it sort of went up and then it went down. There is no line. Is the line there? Is the line there? Is the line there? Where, where just because I got two thousand halfway through 2000 and, you know, here it's going up. But how can I predict that it's, it, it may not just because, so it's, it, this is not a good um, data set for trying to use the regression line. The dots are pretty much all over the place. The residual from our, whatever line we drew, the dots would be too far away. They've got some outliers here and different functions. So it looks like, how do we know in 2013 she'll start climbing back up again? Um, again, so this graph A, um, if the dots are sort of pretty much, you know, um, not too far from the line, then we've got a pretty good predictor. And they're, if they're evenly dispersed above and below the line, then maybe this line is a good fit. If all the dots are, um, if you drew your regression line and all the dots somehow are one side of the line, you'd say, no, it's not a good fit at all. Um, you know, if the, we, we couldn't use this line to predict the data. Maybe the line's more something like that. So um, let's see if there's a correlation between the age of a vehicle and the cost of repairs. You'd think so. You'd think that the older the car, the vehicle is, uh, that repair costs will go up. So we gathered um, some data. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. Gathered nine pieces of data. Ooh, eight. Eight pieces of data. Two, three, four, five, six, seven. Ooh, I'm seeing nine. Uh, anyway, um, okay. Oh, sorry, that's a total. I do apologize. Okay, eight pieces of data with a total. And uh, we've got the amount spent on um, the repairs. So we, this particular vehicle was one year old and $70 was spent. This particular vehicle, eight years old, $350 spent on repairs. Uh, same sort of deal. We, we find the uh, deviation from the mean of x, 48 divided by 8, 6. So uh, 1 is 5 below that mean. And the same with our y. Uh, y is 70 and the mean of y is 280. So it's 200. And this one particular piece of data is 210 below the data. Find all of the deviations, square them, do our little calculation, and we can come up with a an equation for B. We could be using the um, again that recall B. I think back in our calculator, recall B will give me the slope of the regression line once we've entered it, and recall A, the y-intercept. We'll see in a minute in Excel there is a formula for the slope and there's a formula for the intercept. So once you've got your slope and your y-intercept, you've got enough to be able to create your um, equation. So it looks like from here, B was 45. And uh, it looks like uh, A was uh, 10. We plug some data in uh, for, for, for the slope. And let's just see what that looks like. We've come up with an equation. Uh, once you go, if you were to key that data in, key that in, go recall uh, B for the slope, you're going to get 45. Recall A, and you're going to get 10. Once you've got those two pieces of data, we can pretty much put it in the in the formula y equals a plus bx. So what this is telling me is pretty much if I had a vehicle technically that that was brand new zero, no, brand new, zero times uh, $45 is going to give me zero. So I'm expecting to um, spend $10 on it, perhaps, as long as that was in my data set. But of course, really, it's not. It's a little outside the range. The smallest piece of data here we've got is one year, right up to 12. So we really should only use the data set to predict within the range, but it was just showing you where the y-intercept would be. 
So when x equals 0, y equals 10. Um, and then we could attempt to predict it. Well, let's just go and see what, and again, what it's suggesting, the slope means pretty much for every year that the, the vehicle increases in age, the repair dollars prices are going to go up by $45, 10 plus $45 for every year. So uh, let's have a look at it and see how effective it is. So these dots are the raw data. And because our R was, um, I think it was 0.82. Did we do 0.82? I'm just trying to see whether we did it. No, we didn't in this equation. But we would find R is pretty strong because those dots are very close to the line. So uh, almost on it. So very strong positive correlation. And, we've, and it's a good predictor. The line's a good predictor because the dots are so close to the line. And so we don't have all the data. We don't have enough, you know, all the data for six, for example, but we could be pretty confident that if a vehicle was six, uh, six years of age, or six years uh, old, we we're going to spend pretty much $300. If we wanted to predict, uh, you know, 10 years old, we don't have any data for 10, but we could go up and predict how much we'd spend on repairs. So this is what um, we've, we've got R, but we also have uh, the coefficient of determination uh, being R squared. So the correlation coefficient is R and the coefficient of determination R squared. Worth knowing a few of these terms because you may be asked them in a multiple choice question or something like that. Uh, it's a shame that you've got to commit stuff like that to memory, but but there it is. Uh, part of it could be part of the exam. Um, so really, obviously, if we've got a negative r, like 0 0.8, minus 0 0.8, when you square it, it's going to become a positive. So even if, if r is negative or positive, where r squared will always between be between 0 and 1. And the, the re, what statisticians do with the value of r squared is they use that as a bit of a predictor of what the what the relationship is between the change in x and the change in y. Let's see if we can see an example. So if, for example, we had um, some x data and y data and r squared happened to be 85, 0.85 or 85%, what we what statisticians say is that the change in y is about 85% of the change in y is due to the change in x and 15% is due to other factors so getting way back to our original thought of advertising versus spending imagine uh, as we're spending money in advertising and sales, and we, we had an R squared of, of 0.85, what we're suggesting is that, look, as we spend money in advertising, as it's uh, increasing, 85% uh, of the change in our sales is because we're of, the, of the change in our advertising dollars. And there's another 15%, which is outside the advertising, you know, sort of other factors such as um, just it's a cold day, there's an increase in demand or the economy or whatever. So let's have a quick look. I think we're getting towards the end of these slides and uh, we'll have a look at how we'd find A, the, the y-intercept, B, the slope, and R, the correlation coefficient using Excel. There is a feature, the linear regression line. We obtain it. Uh, it's one of the... Um, I believe it's an Excel add-in. We'll talk more about that when we get to class. But we need to go up in the, yes, it is data analysis. It's an Excel add-in. So if it's not on the menu, we'll show you how you can add it, or the textbook will show you how you can add it as well. Um, but we would go to select data on the menu option, data analysis, and we scroll down until we find regression. Put in the Y values, put in the X values, press OK, and it will come up with some residuals, shall it tell us what the R value is. We'll have a look at that now. Let's jump into uh, Excel. This is the last thing we'll do and uh, see how it works. Um, sorry about this, um, one of these notifications up here. Whoops. Um, let's go back and hopefully that will go on. No, it's not. LMAC. 
Okay, um, so we've got some data here, some X data and some Y data. And uh, basically, what, all we need is the slope and the Y intercept. So the formula for the slope down here is just that. It says equals the slope. I'm going to hit the FX so we can see the window. Basically, when you type slope um, and click the, the function slope, it'll say, tell me where your Y values are. So all you've got to do is highlight the Ys and then say, tell me where your Xs are. So highlight the X and bang, it's automatically found the, the whoops, I didn't want to do that. I just delete, uh, press the tick. It's found the slope to be 0.764. So every time X goes up by one, Y goes up by 0.764. What about um, the Y intercept? Same deal, if you were to click on the window for the intercept, uh, we just tell it where the y's are, tell it where the x's are, and it will find the intercept for us. So we've now got enough to really draw our regression line. It will be y equals $240 plus 0.764x, because it's positive, it's plus 0.764x. We've also got another formula. The formula for the correlation in Excel is in exactly that, it's Corel. And then again, same sort of deal. You've just got to tell it where, where is your first array, where is your X values, where's the, the Y value, what you're trying to measure. And once you plug, once you tell it that, it'll cal calculate. A, a 0.95, very, very uh, strong uh, correlation so all the dots should be pretty close to the uh, x-axis now th there is another way of getting the regression line and uh, here's r squared simply that value squared is 0.95 and the other thing we could do if, if ever you're um, drawing a graph uh, and click insert and then insert your line graph uh, all we need to do then is click on any of the Y series, but it's a right mouse button click um, and format trend line. And it says, what would you like? And it's not an exponential, it is a linear regression. So it's a, it's a line, so you just click on the line and it will immediately, and you can say, hey, would you like the formula written on, on the bar as well? somewhere down here, display the equation on the chart. Yes, please. And it um, it has put the uh, linear regression, picked up the slope, picked up the y-intercept, but it's also drawn your graph in. Uh, if we, again, picking up the y-intercept, if we were to continue that line, it would cross the y-axis at 240, the y-intercept. When x equals zero, what does y equal? So look, that's, um, that'll do us for today. A pretty quick introduction. We'll be working on some uh, practical questions, either using Excel or the financial calculator in class to solve, find the correlation, find R, find R squared, find the slope, find the intercept. Um, and that will, that will, and we'll also be using it uh, in our assignment question.